if you uh, get a doctorate in German history, um, it's basically your lot that you're going to do a, a deep dive through the history of, uh, of the Holocaust and related, uh, related matters. Uh, I, those of you who've, who've been to some of these lectures before will remember that uh, my grandfather was a tank commander in the Second World War and then was briefly actually uh, posted uh, to, the, to the Nuremberg trials in some capacity, I, I forget exactly what, but he decided he was not really into it. And the reason was that he didn't like the fact that they were trying uh, Admiral Dönitz and Admiral Raider. He thought that they were soldiers. He didn't think the others were. Um, he thought that if you were going to participate in having large numbers of civilians shot that you pretty much forfeited the, 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 the designation of soldiers. But he didn't like the fact that they were trying Dernitz and Raider, so he, he had himself assigned elsewhere. Um, but so I've always found the topic kind of, uh, kind of interesting. Um, well, OK. I'm also, I'm a little shocked that I got this many people. I'm shocked in a happy way. Um, <laughs> Uh, that I got this many, this many people. Uh, I find this stuff really interesting. One of the things that if you, I'm going to say this last thing and then I'm going to start for real. One of the things you'll notice if you come to a lot of these lectures is that I tend to get kind of rushed at the end and the, my problem is, this is why I'm a terrible lecturer and probably better as a librarian, that I, there's so many interesting sort of factlets that I know that I just can't stop myself in the course of things from stopping and being like, oh, there's this other interesting thing. And then I look up you know, and I'm 80 minutes in, and I, you know, it's like, oh, the, then it finished. Everyone was guilty. Um, okay, so uh, welcome to the third annual Holocaust Memorial Lecture here at Mentor Public Library. Um, it's the 18th. The Holocaust Remembrance Day is really the 22nd, which is the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz by the Red Army. Uh, I think that this is a good thing to keep having uh, because the events are worth remembering. Uh, they're important events for the 20th century. One, I, was, I, I was teaching at the University of Washington at one point, and I was a teaching assistant for this woman who was straight out of the Humboldt University. She was very bright, but she'd never taught in an American university before. And she said to me at one point, she was kind of having a little trouble relating to the students, and she said to me, and I think this was true, the difference between them and me <coughs> is that I think the Holocaust is the most important event of the 20th century, and they don't. Um, but it's, it's mostly from being poorly informed. Um, you can argue about what else might be. But uh, so before I get going, uh, my name is John Foster. I'm a librarian here at Manor Public Library in the Adult Information Services Department. Uh, many of you have probably seen me if you frequent the library, uh, hunker down at the desk. Um, I have a doctorate in European history from the University of Washington. I have several other degrees and stuff. Um, although I always think to myself, you know, uh, if you're going to, you'll really respect what I have to say if what I turn out to say is, is substantial as opposed to, I know a lot of kind of dopey people with doctorates, but here's another weird thing. <laughs> if you want to talk about, so there were two groups who were overrepresented among sort of Nazi hierarchy. Among the hierarchy generally, Austrians were statistically overrepresented. I've never understood why necessarily, but... But among the people who ran the, like, especially who were involved in the Holocaust, uh, people with doctorates were statistically overrepresented. I don't, I don't know why that is. Uh, I certainly don't think of that as a reason not to pursue higher education, but, uh, but there are plenty, I mean, Ernst Kaltenbrunner, who's not in this picture, but, uh, but who was one of the worst people tried in this particular trial, uh, had a PhD, was, I think it was a uh, legal PhD or something like that. Fairly early in the Second World War, the, the allies, or the group of states that come to be allies, started talking about what it is exactly, whoops, that they would do uh, when, they, uh, when the war was over and they were victorious. And they pretty much assumed, especially starting in December 1941, that they were going to win. I mean, Churchill was pretty, was pretty clear after the United States entered the war after Pearl Harbor, that in the long run, the Allied cause was going to be victorious. There was no way that Germany and Japan, even Italy, 
uh, less of a consideration by their lights, but could stand up against the industrial might of the United States and Great Britain and the Soviet Union working together. So they started sort of talking about what it was that they were going to do. Uh, and in the beginning, the, uh, their ideas about what they were going to do were fairly bloodthirsty. Uh, the British uh, cabinet discussed it, and the most commonly expressed idea was that uh, uh, the Nazi leadership should be summarily executed to the extent that any of them could be caught. Um, but over the course of the next several years, uh, and for a number of reasons that we'll sort of discuss as things go on, they eventually kind of <coughs> developed a kind of a more moderated position on what they were going to do that was essentially connected with the kind of world that they wanted to build uh, after the war. I mean, for a long time, they didn't really want to talk about, they were so sort of caught up with the idea of what are we going to do to win the war that they didn't really want to talk very much about what sort of a world might, might turn out to arise after the end of the war. But once they did, uh, it became clear to them fairly quickly that uh, what was needed was something that was going to avoid a repeat of what had happened after the First World War. Uh, the trial opened uh, actually on the 20th of November. This is the first day, and this is uh, Richard H. Jackson, the chief prosecutor, correct, uh, an associate justice of the US Supreme Court delivering the opening statement. Uh, the plan started uh, as early as December 1941. You can tell <coughs> that it's not coincidental that the British cabinet was discussing in December 1941 uh, what was going to happen because it had become clear to them that now there was a good chance that they were going to win. Up until that point, and particularly those of you who, who, who listen to me talk about Churchill will recall, uh, the, the British really felt like they were treading water. Uh, but once we were in the war, they knew that in the long run, uh, the Allied side was going to be, was going to win. Um, there's a really interesting moment. This is, this is talked about extensively in uh, William Manchester's biography of, of Churchill, the third volume of, of, of which uh, is, is uh, dis discusses what happened at the Tehran conference. So at the Tehran conference in November, December 1943, there was a sort of dinner party late at night uh, and Churchill, Roosevelt, Stalin, Molotov, a bunch of other people were there. And they were kind of talking about what they should do about the Nazi leadership. And uh, <coughs> Stalin said, well, I think probably what needs to happen is for us to shoot 50 or 100,000 German officers. <laughs> and uh, Churchill said, well, I, I think that's excessive, don't you? I mean, I think that that's, I think that's a little much. And then Roosevelt chimed in. Roosevelt was in this weird period at this point where he was kind of ganging up with Stalin on Churchill. Uh, he liked to kind of tease Churchill in a, in a way that was a little unfortunate. He didn't like colonialism. Um, and he also thought that he could charm Stalin about which he was sadly incorrect. I mean, weirdly enough, Churchill really understood Stalin far better than Roosevelt ever did. Uh, Churchill knew that you couldn't trust Stalin any farther than you could throw him. In terms of what he said, but once you knew what he wanted, you could tell with certainty what he was going to do. I mean, was, this is the great thing about, and Churchill, Stalin could also be kind of friendly in a weird way. I mean, it's hard to say that about a guy who's responsible for, you know, 20 or 30 million murders, but, um, so anyway, Roosevelt kind of chimes in sort of jokingly, well, we, we can just shoot 49,000 instead. <laughs> and um, Churchill became kind of incensed. And he said, you know, I, I just think this is completely barbaric. And really, if, if this is the, if this is the uh, path that you insist on taking, I'd prefer to be taken out in the garden and shot right now. And he stormed out. And uh, he went into another room. And he was sort of standing around kind of collecting himself. And he felt a hand on his shoulder, and here's Stalin with Molotov behind him. He said, look, you know, we were just kind of joking about that. Which is a, you know, Stalin is the kind of person who would, and in fact had, have 50 or, 50 or 100,000 people shot. So when he joked about it, it was a little macabre. You know, it was not the kind of thing you could just sort of brush off. Uh, but Churchill got over it and went back to the party. So discussions of it sort of 
uh, percolated among the Allied governments through 1944. Uh, and what eventually ended up happening was that uh, it, was, it was decided that what needed to happen was uh, that the uh, there were still some people who were very much in favor of just summary execution. But what the governments decided was that what they wanted to have happen was for these people to be exposed to some sort of um, legitimate, so to speak, legal process so that a difference could be established between the sorts of processes and rules that they were being exposed to uh, as opposed to the sort of uh, illegal uh, way that they had been conducting themselves toward their own people uh, and also toward the, the, uh, the peoples in Europe that they had, that they had uh, seized power over. So the question was, uh, what sort of law was this going to be? Now, there had been for about a century uh, discussions of, for a long time, the sort of idea about war was, war is a sort of law unto itself, and whatever happens in war, that's what happens. I mean, if you look at the history of the Thirty Years' War in the, between 1618 and 1648 in Germany, uh, there was pretty much anyone was fair game, and a, a fairly large portion of the population of Central Europe was killed. So it wasn't until the sort of middle of the 19th century, uh, but I should say, in the middle of the 19th century, people started thinking more seriously about what the laws of, of, of war should be. Um, it had happened in the, in the uh, 18th century particularly, uh, war had been very professional. And armies had done a relatively good job of keeping uh, war to a sort of conflict between sort of professional groups. Uh, the French Revolution changed this to a great extent because uh, what you get is the sort of levy en masse, like the large, uh, large groups of the population being brought into the army. I mean, one of the differences <coughs> between the Prussian army and, the, Napole and the, the French Revolutionary armies was that the Prussian army, you know, the theory of the Prussian army was the soldiers should be more afraid of their officers than they are of the enemy, and that uh, for this reason, the, the, the Prussians, the officers had to be fairly close to the troops all the time. Uh, French revolutionary armies, because they were much more sort of nationalistic, motivated by a kind of internal concern for the nation, could operate out of sight of the generals more effectively. Um, that's a, nationalism in war is another, it's another story. Um, but starting in the 18... Uh, 50s and 60s, people started sort of codifying what could go on in war. And the, the major figure here is a guy named Franz Lieber, uh, who was born in Berlin in 1798. Uh, he fought in the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, he also then fought uh, as a sort of mercenary in the Greek Civil War in the 1820s. Uh, he then uh, moved to Boston, where he got a job running a gymnasium, and not like the educational kind, I mean like a swimming club. Um, but he worked as a translator, he worked on uh, uh, encyclopedic projects, and he worked as an educator. And eventually he uh, became professor of uh, history and political economics at South Carolina College, now the University of South Carolina. Uh, he had three sons. Uh, when the Civil War broke out, one of them joined the South and the other two joined the North. Uh, he himself was a strong supporter of the Union. Uh, moved to New York, uh, worked for uh, an entity called the uh, Loyal Publication Society, which was essentially a kind of uh, publicity arm of the US government putting out uh, pro-union uh, materials. And uh, he, did, he did sort of what we might these days call propaganda work with the War Department. And in this context, uh, he was asked by the War Department and by Lincoln to develop a code for battlefield conduct uh, in the course of late 1862 and 1863. Now, the 
the time that this happens is important, and, and the reason why, and you'll notice, say, so he was commissioned by the Lincoln administration, the race of enemy combatants cannot be a consideration. And this is key, and the reason is because this was done sort of in concert with the issuing of the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, the South had said that they were going to treat black soldiers as criminals. And the North said, well, no, you know, we're going to have their soldiers just like anyone else. You have to, you have to treat them that way. They, they didn't really assent to this, unfortunately. But um, also that, uh, interestingly, ethical treatment of local inhabitants. Uh, this, when Sherman marched through Georgia and the Carolinas, rather went by the wayside. Um, quarter must be offered to the enemy. This was mostly honored. You know, you very rarely in the Civil War got those sort of no quarter asked, none given type of situations. Uh, but it said that if people were spies or partisans, sorry that this is so low, but I always forget that this thing is, uh, that they could be summarily executed without trial. In the late 19th century, as, as tensions began to rise in, in Europe, uh, a number of European states decided that they wanted to take on some of the ideas that the Libra Code uh, had, had propounded. And you'll notice I've put a few little bits of it here. And, and the, the, the point really is that a lot of what was in the Libra Code is also in the Hague Convention of 1907, including humane treatment of, of, uh, <coughs> humane treatment of prisoners. Uh, you can't despoil prisoners of their belongings. Uh, this is too small to read, and I'm not going to read all of it. I just put it up there as a kind of mnemonic for myself. Um, you're allowed to have prisoners do work as long as it's not too onerous. Uh, they have to be paid if you're going to if you're going to have them labor. Um, the wages of prisoners shall go to improving their position, and and the balance shall be paid to them at the time of their release. I strongly doubt that any prisoner of war at any point was paid money at the point of his release, but we'll just leave that at that. These, this is tiny. Um, but I'm just going to go through some of these. No poison, no poison weaponry. Um, no killing people who've laid down their arms. No declarations of no quarter. Uh, no using munitions that would cause superfluous injury, like you're only allowed to kill people you can't purposely maim them, I guess is. Um, you can't use, make improper use of a flag of truce. Um, you can't destroy the enemy's property uh, unless you have to. That, that was fairly liberally interpreted during the First World War. You can't compel people to fight against their own side. Uh, any pressure on the population of an occupied territory to take the oath to, to sort of join up the other side is prohibited. Uh, private property cannot be confiscated. These, these are all sort of ideals, right, that, that uh, if you know much about war in the 20th century were uh, fairly consistently ignored. Um, pillage is formally prohibited. I mean, this is what soldiers do. I mean, like, let's, if you just look at the long history of warfare, part of the kind of payback for putting your life on the line is, you know, and a little light pillaging here and there is probably all right. Um, I mean, who am I to say no? And this, in fact, so when it turned out that uh, as the Red Army uh, uh, advanced to the eastern part of Germany at the end of the Second World War and committed several hundred thousand acts of rape and uh, sundry other acts of violence, uh, the German communist part, representative of the German Communist Party, went to Stalin and said, um, maybe you should bring these people in. And Stalin said, no, um, these, these guys have had a long, hard fight, and they're going to take some, the fruits of their victory, if you will. Um, so uh, I, there's a sort of recognition that, that part of the kind of compensation, if you want to, if you want to refer to it that way, of being a soldier is, is uh, at least some of these things, if not all of them. So at the end of the First World War, uh, the uh, Allied powers, the Entente powers, wanted to have trials for people uh, that they viewed uh, as having been war criminals on the German side, pretty much exclusively. 
And so this was at a time uh, in, the, in the wake of the Treaty of Versailles where the Germans had essentially been compelled to sign uh, Articles 227 through 230, which essentially uh, forced them to concede that they were solely responsible for that war. They were called the War Guilt Clauses. And this was a matter of real upset in Germany. And in fact, uh, uh, I, I think it's pretty fair to say an injustice. I think if you read Christopher Clark's book, The Sleepwalkers, which is about the outbreak of the First World War, what you'll find is that uh, there were a lot of people, uh, there was a lot of blame to go around. And I mean, certainly it was the, the, the Germans who violated the Belgian frontier to start out with, but uh, the French had been, had been engaging in these hinky arms deals with the Serbians for a long time. Lots of people were doing lots of things. So. Um, there was a kind of feeling, and, you know, those of you who, who remember my, <coughs> excuse me, talk about the origins of National Socialism will re recall that the, you know, the German people had been kind of told for a long time that they were winning, and then it turned out in fairly short order that they were losing, um, and they were looking around for people to blame, right, Just, you know, and people like Hitler said, well, it's the Jews and it's the, the communists who stabbed you in the back. But the, the Treaty of Versailles was a real thorn in, in the side of the German conscience, consciousness at that time. Uh, they really wanted to try the Kaiser. But the Kaiser had abdicated and gone to Holland, and the Dutch said that they wouldn't give him up. Uh, and not wanting to kind of get into a big hassle over it, they said, well, OK, we'll let the Germans try these people, right? We'll have these trials. They had them in, in Leipzig. Uh, and the, the Entente Power submitted a list of 900 names of people that they wanted tried. Uh, the Germans tried 12 of them, uh, sentenced them to terms ranging from nothing to four years, uh, and then almost promptly am amnestied most of them. And these were people who were, you know, pretty obviously guilty of, I mean, these were mostly low-level people that they tried, people who had been guilty of shooting civilians or what have you. And the, the, the Germans were just completely uninterested in, in trying them. And the lesson that a lot of the sort of uh, people in the Entente powers drew was, well, you just can't have them do it, right? I mean, we're going to have to have some accountability, and it can't be the Germans, it can't be the, the, the losing side doing it. So starting in uh, the fall of 1943, the Allies start trying to kind of establish a basis on which this trial is going to happen. And um, there's a couple of fairly obvious problems. Those of you more legal cast of mind will immediately think to yourself, well, what was illegal about what these people did, right? I mean, so there's the question of ex post facto, which is a, 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 a principle well established in American law, which is that you cannot hold somebody responsible for an act that was not illegal at the time that they did it. So you can't, someone does act A, later on you decide that that's bad and make a law against it and then prosecute that person. If it wasn't illegal at the time, you can't prosecute someone for it. And a lot of people said, a lot of the defendants said, well look, none of what we did was what law did we break, right? Um, also, uh, there was the question of, uh, how can you have, what is the basis of international law? I mean, so law requires a kind of, some sort of sovereignty, right? So we can have law in the United States because whatever else you think about, most of you probably think about the government, there's, there's legitimate sovereignty in the country. So uh, there's a kind of authority that's, um, that's neutral vis-a-vis -vis people, and can, uh, and can sort of apply the law in a balanced way. But in the international arena, there isn't that sort of sovereign power. I mean, some people say, well, God is a sovereign power. And if everyone worshiped the same one, that might be a viable <laughs> premise. But it's not, sadly. So what you get is a sort of series of uh, kind of letters of intent starting in uh, October of 1943, 
And essentially the idea is uh, we're going to apply uh, sort of customary laws of war. Uh, and there was a lot of debate internally among the, among the allied powers about what this was going to actually involve, right? Because uh, if it's not, I mean, lawyers like to have very discrete precedent written out before they do something so that they, they have a text to refer to. Um, but what essentially was decided was that they were going to, uh, first of all, they were going to apply, if you had signed up to uh, international agreements. So one of the things they said was, Germany was a party to the Hague Conventions. So to the extent that they violated the Hague Conventions, that's against the, that's against the law. And then they said, well, uh, there are sort of generally accepted rules for how soldiers conduct themselves. You, you cannot go around just randomly shooting civilians. Um, much less systematically uh, going around trying to extirpate uh, populations as a whole. So the idea that they came around to eventually was that uh, they were going to charge the, the uh, defendants with a series of four uh, crimes. Uh, participation in a common plan or conspiracy for the accomplishment of a crime against peace, planning, initiating, and waging wars of aggression and other crimes against peace, war crimes, crimes against humanity. So you can kind of see uh, this is sort of, this they wanted to kind of sweep up all the people who'd been part of the sort of Nazi hierarchy before the war. So they were kind of setting the groundwork, right? And then uh, this is for the sort of uh, military people involved in planning like the invasion of the Soviet Union. Right, so they need something that's going to explicitly get to that. War crimes is a fairly, uh, uh, it's, it's one of those things, you know, you kind of revert to Potter Stewart. Uh, I, you know, I may not be able to define it, but I know it when I see it. Um, war crimes, especially uh, shooting people who've surrendered, uh, mistreatment of prisoners, uh, shooting civilians, despoiling civilians, and then crimes against humanity was a sort of idea that they came up with to try and encompass the, the crimes specifically relating to the Holocaust, uh, which were, by their lights, kind of had not really been seen before in the modern world. This is not exactly true. Um, the uh, Various colonial powers had engaged in things that would fall under this case, especially Germany in the case of the Nama and the Herero people in Southwest Africa. Uh, also the Turks and the Armenian genocide. That's a very fraught topic right now and the Turkish government does not concede that that's what it was. Scholars generally do uh, view that that was the case. Um, but uh, Hitler himself said, who now remembers the Armenians? Uh, and, and this was part of his sort of justification for undertaking the, the, the attempt to get rid of all the, the Jews in the world, as far as he was concerned. Uh, the leader of the uh, American delegation was Robert H. Jackson. Uh, at this point, he was, the, he was an associate justice on the US Supreme Court. Uh, he had no formal legal training. Uh, after he went to college, he, uh, excuse me, he did not go to college. He worked, in, after high school, he worked in his uncle's law firm uh, achieved his legal training then. At that point, college degree was not required to, uh, to be a member of the bar. Uh, he became associated with the Roosevelt faction in the state of New York. Uh, after Roosevelt was uh, elected, he eventually became the Solicitor General. Uh, I had, was not, I was unaware until I read Telford Taylor's book about this, what the Solicitor General is. Uh, it's the, the government's lawyer for arguing in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, he had an incredible win record in front of the Supreme Court, such that uh, Louis Brandeis said that, uh, that uh, Robert Jackson should be the Solicitor General for the rest of his life. Um, eventually, he was then uh, U.S. Attorney General in 1940 and 41, and then was uh, appointed to the Supreme Court in, in 1941, served in 1954. 
Uh, Jackson was a really interesting guy. Uh, he was very passionately committed to uh, the cause of seeing justice done against Nazi war criminals, but he was not really that committed to the idea of the International Military Tribunal. What he pretty clearly wanted, there's a really great book, I wish I had brought it with me, I have it upstairs, in which I'll put it back into circulation when I'm done here, uh, written by Telford Taylor, who we'll get to in a minute here. Um, and Taylor was pretty much of the opinion that uh, Jackson at times wanted to kind of sabotage the negotiation with the other three powers so that they could just, we could just stage zonal trials. You know, at that point, Germany was broken up or in the process of being broken up into four zones of occupation. And what Jackson really wanted to do was to have trials in the individual zones in which whoever had whichever war criminal could try them there. Um, uh, eventually he was, he was dissuaded from this. Part of the reason was that Jackson really did not like the Russians, uh, didn't trust them, uh, and was afraid that they were going to sort of turn, the, I mean, he knew what had gone on in the show trials in the 30s, and he didn't want this to get turned into another sort of like, you know, he wanted it to be a real trial. I mean, he thought, he said over and over, there's, there's really no point in doing this if it's just going to be a, you know, a sort of formality on the way to the execution chamber. Um, so he really, uh, it was only sort of with great uh, effort that he was sort of prevailed upon to um, to have the sort of full international uh, trial with all the allied powers participating. Now, an interesting thing, which I I thought to mention earlier, is that uh, so the the four powers, the Russians, the Soviets, us, the French, and the British, were kind of trying to decide how they were going to go about this legally. And one thing, this is another thing which I did not know until I read Telford Taylor's book, uh, that uh, the European law at that point didn't have the concept of conspiracy. Uh, but that's a, that's a pretty uh, common principle in US law. So if you conspire to commit a crime, that in itself is a crime. Even if you don't then manage to commit the crime later on, conspiring to break the law is also against the law. And uh, the Europeans thought this was really weird, because really they thought th that you shouldn't, you know, the law is the law if you break the law. I mean, in a, in a sort of uh, European-style trial, everybody knows all the evidence beforehand, and then there's a kind of discussion about it, and then you render a judgment. You don't get this sort of like adversarial uh, discovery driven process that we have in US courts. So there was a real sort of, uh, a lot of what went on in the negotiations in 1944 was an attempt to find a way that the American, European, and Soviet uh, legal systems could work together. I mean, the, the Soviet legal system, such as it was. Um, Soviet legal system was very efficient. Um, if, if, sometimes, you know, I hear people talk about how like we want you know the greatest efficiency and I think to myself sometimes efficiency is not in and of itself a virtue. Um, so uh, there were a number of uh, problems that had to be sorted out and, and Telford Taylor uh, who, was, who was Jackson's assistant uh, and the associate prosecutor was uh, uh, responsible for a lot of the organization of how it was done. Now, what had to be done was they had to find a lot of evidence. They had to find a lot of documents. And they had to get the documents translated into languages that everybody understood. So to get back to the question someone was raising earlier, um, <coughs> they had to also organize a trans like simultaneous translation. Uh, which we have a lot of facilities for now, but didn't then. And at one point, somebody was saying to me, my wife probably, are you going to play any footage from the trial? And I decided not to. And the reason is because it's all very slow. And they talk and stop very slowly because they had to wait for the translation to happen. And they wanted to talk very clearly. So it's very stilted. And it's kind of, it kind of uh, 
detracts from the, the, the power. I mean, there's a moment where uh, they have uh, Eric von den Bach-Zalewski, who was an SS Ober Obergruppenführer, which is kind of a general, uh, talking about, and one of the most blood-soaked of the Nazi criminals, uh, who was not on trial here, he was just giving evidence, got in the courtroom, Rebecca West, who was covering the whole thing for The New Yorker, described him as seeming like uh, a kind of stolid and very serious insurance broker. Uh, and he just described in fairly straightforward terms how they had killed 90,000 people by shooting in the Soviet Union in his little part of it. Uh, and it was pretty stunning to the courtroom because, you know, when you hear someone talk about the sort of like murder the old-fashioned way of 90,000 human beings from babes in arms up to people, you know, at the end of their lives or of great age, that's a very stunning sort of thing. And he just sort of talked about it, you know, in pretty straightforward terms. But the trial was full of things like that. I mean, it was really one of the real victories of the trial was effectively presenting what had gone on and why it was necessary that that these people be tried in this way. But Jackson and, and, and Taylor as well were really adamant that it had to be, the charges had to be proved, right? That it had to be, there had to be, it had to be possible that someone could be innocent, that someone could be acquitted by this trial. Maybe not innocent, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, Taylor had gone into the army, he was a lawyer. He'd gone into the army as a major. Uh, he represented US intelligence at Bletchley Park and uh, code breaking. British code-breaking uh, operation at Bletchley Park. Uh, he was promoted to colonel in 1944 and assigned to be Jackson's assistant. Um, he led the prosecution of the high command case. So they were, um, when they discussed it, there was sort of extensive discussion about who it was they were going to try. And they wanted to try a bunch of people. They wanted to make it sort of extensive. And this is the international military team. So you'll see this referred to as the IMT. And then later on, there were sort of the subs what were called the subsequent Nuremberg trials, or the, uh, the subsequent NMTs, the Nuremberg Military Tribunals. We'll talk about that a little later on. But they wanted to make sure that they tried not just the German government people, but the high command, too. This was a matter of, this was something that, about which there was a lot of debate. Because the, you know, the question is, well, are these people soldiers? And if they're soldiers, don't they have to just do what the civilian government says? Um, but it had been established in the Hague Convention that you really can't, uh, obedience to uh, an order that causes you to violate accepted laws of war is not obligatory. Even though most of these guys, I mean, so when, these, when, the, when the people on trial gave their kind of explanations, the, the most often heard one, and if you look at the sort of large scope of these war crimes trials, it's always, well, I was ordered to do it. Um, no one ever suffered any consequences for not, for saying no, by the way. Um, but uh, so they wanted to um, make sure that they got the high command, and Taylor was, was involved in, uh, that was his sort of subgroup. So they wanted to get the remaining Nazi leadership, particularly Hermann Goering, who was the, the, uh, the senior leading Nazi to be captured. Uh, Martin Bormann, who had been sort of Hitler's, uh, uh, real, really Hitler's favorite. Bormann was nowhere to be found. And later it turned out that he had, he and three other, four or five other SS guys had fled the bunker after Hitler shot himself and had, uh, gotten themselves shot by the, or killed in an artillery attack by the Red Army trying to cross the spray on the Friedrichstrasse Bridge. Um, they wanted to get the political associates, uh, von Papen, Konstantin von Neurath, uh, uh, von Ribbentrop, who had negotiated, the, who was the foreign minister who had negotiated the Nazi-Soviet pact. <laughs> And they wanted to get economic and business leaders. This was a big thing. Jackson was really up on this. Like we want, so the, the business leaders had facilitated this, <coughs> the Nazi program. And you know, you'll hear a lot of times people say, well, the Nazis like got rid of all property rights and the, you know, and this was not true. 
Industrialists did fine under the Nazis. It wasn't like there was, the Nazis only really national, literally like one business, and that was the Junkers aircraft manufacturer. Now, they told you what you had to make and how much, but they also paid you for it. And the industrialists made a lot of money. Um, <coughs> um, <coughs> yeah, so they were not, the industrialists were not fleeing Germany under the Nazis. The Jewish ones were, but the but not the, not the non-Jewish ones. Um, so they were looking especially for, um, so there's an interesting thing about Krupp. Krupp, some of you will know, was the great German arms manufacturer. And um, they uh, kept wanting to find uh, the head of Krupp. Um, and so there was the kind of older head of Krupp, and there was, uh, there was, uh, the younger Alfred, his, his son, who had mostly been running things. And there was a kind of misunderstanding about who was meant. The, the Jackson really wanted to try the older one, because he had truly been in charge. But he was, he was dying, essentially. And so there was a kind of back and forth in which people are saying, that there's a kind of like, yeah, you mean like so-and-so. Like, yeah, you mean Alfred. Yeah, so-and-so. Yeah, Alfred. They kept like, and it wasn't until kind of they got to the trout they realized that they, neither one of them had really agreed on which crop they were going to try. And so it turned out that they formally tried the father, but he was sort of released from the trial about halfway through because he was not Campus Mentis at the time. And it was viewed as a real victory for Alfred Krupp, Alfred the son, because he was going to have some serious explaining to do. Now, unfortunately for him, they later on had another trial that he got hooked up in. And, um, but he, in the long run, came out OK. We'll talk about that. Um, they would have liked to try Hitler. Of course, Hitler had committed suicide in April of 1945. Uh, they would have liked to try Heinrich Himmler, the head of the, the SS. He had committed suicide in uh, British custody in May of 1945. Uh, they wanted to try uh, Heinrich Müller, uh, otherwise known as Gestapo Müller. Uh, Müller disappeared, and nobody knows what happened to him. Hopefully nothing good, but um, they wanted to try Adolf Eichmann. Eichmann, by this time, uh, was in hiding and then managed to uh, hide out in South America until 15 or so years later when the Mossad caught up with him. Uh, and they wanted to try Martin Bormann, who uh, nobody at this point knew was dead, but, but was. So these are the defendants, Hermann Goering, the head of the Luftwaffe, and also Hitler's sort of second in command. Rudolf Hess, who had flown famously to England. Hess. <laughs> I, I love the description of him from Manchester's book. He was, he was sort of distinguished by his fanatical loyal to, loyalty to Hitler and his brutish stupidity. Um, Bormann, who they indicted because they didn't know where he was. Uh, Albert Speer. Uh, Konstantin von Neurath. These are government officials. Franz von Papen, jo Joachim von Ribbentrop. Um, sometimes you can't tell the Nazis without a scorecard, so I have to remember. Um, Let's see. Uh, Robert Lai, who was the uh, head of the, uh, the Nazi labor organizations. Alfred Rosenberg, who was their sort of um, uh, chief propagandist, but then later uh, uh, chief sort of intellectual propagandist. Goebbels described. Alfred Rosenberg wrote this book called The Myth of the 20, 20th Century, which is a sort of like a kind of more intellectual version of Mein Kampf, and, uh, which Goebbels described as an intellectual belch. Um, uh, he later became, Rosenberg later became uh, the minister of the Eastern Occupied Territories. Uh, Hans Frank, who had been the governor general of, the, of Poland. Uh, Baldur von Schirach, who was the head of the, um, the Hitler Youth, and who had been involved in the commando operation that liberated Mussolini when he was uh, imprisoned. Uh, Jodl, who was the head of the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht. Uh, Wilhelm Keitel, uh, also part of the Oberkommando. Karl Dönitz and Erich Rader, who were, Erich Rader was the head of the German Navy. Uh, Dönitz was the head of the submarine service and then later head of the Navy. Uh, Fritz Zaukel, who was the Gauleiter. Gauleiter is a sort of Nazi governor of Thuringia. Uh, Otto Seiss Einkort, Ein Inkwart, excuse me, who was the head of the, the Gauleiter of Vienna. Uh, 
Ernst Kaltenbrunner, who was a, a I have to remember his exact position, uh, probably the worst of the guys, uh, uh, the head of the uh, Reichssicherheitshauptamt or the, the Reich security head office of the SS. Uh, Julius Streicher, the editor of Der Stürmer, uh, an unbelievably vile anti-Semitic newspaper. I mean, it was so vile that in 1940, uh, Hitler banned its publication. <laughs> And really, you, you've got to be somewhat impressed by this, right? Because if you've written anti-Semitic garbage that is so vile that Hitler thinks you've crossed a line, I mean, you've really accomplished something. Something horrible, but something. Uh, <coughs> Walter Funk, who was the head of the, uh, Hjalmar Schacht was the head of the Reichsbank. Hjalmar Schacht was a really bright guy. He had some very crackpot ideas. Uh, Walter Funk uh, was the head of the Reichsbank after Schalk. Fritzsche was a, Hans Fritzsche was a broadcaster who it was a sort of propagandist whose voice sounded a lot like Goebbels. So he got a job doing radio broadcasts that Goebbels didn't want to do. Um, Albert Speer. Um, so uh, the Americans got to do uh, Nazi organizations, conspiracy, crimes against peace. The British were responsible for treaty violations, violations like of the, the Hague Conventions and crimes on the high seas. The French did uh, crimes against humanity in the west, and the Soviets did crimes against humanity in the east. I don't know why that cut off east, but there you go. Um, there's an interesting thing about uh, the sort of crimes on the high seas. So the British were, it was mostly sort of involved with the kind of submarine warfare from which the British had suffered very badly. Um, but it turned out that uh, Dernitz and Raider had really, and the, and the German Navy had mostly obeyed the laws of war. There were a couple of cases where they had shot <coughs> seamen escaping from a sinking ship, but the British had done that too, it turned out. Now, the Allies decided very early on that they were going to not accept uh, what in legal parlance is referred to as a two quoque defense. Do you know what that is? You did it too. Um, so the, 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 you know, what they didn't want was the Germans saying, well, you know, you firebombed Hamburg, you firebombed Dresden, you, you know, explicitly targeted German civilians, which we did. Um, there's, there's no two ways about it. Uh, the fact of the matter is, if I go out and commit a murder, it doesn't make any difference if someone else commits a murder too. Like, I'm still guilty of committing the murder, so it, does, it doesn't make me less guilty. The question of, like, whether the other person should be whatever that is, another, is another issue. But they, so the, the, the British really came to the conclusion that so Dernitz and Rader were guilty of the sort of conspiracy piece, right, because the war itself was illegal. But as far as what the German Navy had done uh, in the conduct of their war on the sea, that was pretty much just par for the course. I mean, the British had, with pretty much no warning, sunk the French fleet uh, in, the, in the Mediterranean. Uh, so the, the British you know, I think we're willing to be a little flexible, uh, or at least recognize that, that uh, Rader and Dönitz hadn't grossly violated, hadn't grossly deviated from what was normally acceptable. Um, so before I get to this point, I will just say that, so a lot of the trial was very slow, very long presentations of evidence. I mean, they, they really made a point of, uh, you know, Jackson was very adamant. We want to make sure that these people, that it's clear to everyone that these people are guilty, right? That this is not a case of the victors just imposing justice on a, on a defeated, on a defeated people. Because it has to be, once again, what we're trying to do is create, uh, this is sort of around the time of the formation of the United Nations. Uh, a kind of re-attempt at the sort of organization that the, uh, that the League of Nations had, had failed at being, sort of uh, a way of enforcing civilized standards around the world. And so what they wanted to do was to establish a principle wherein uh, it was possible to have a trial that was not just a kind of drumhead uh, affair, 
Um, so, and in fact, there were three acquittals. Uh, Schacht, uh, I think quite justifiably was acquitted because, I mean, he was an, kind of a nut, but he wasn't, he hadn't done anything. Uh, unlike Funk, his successor, Funk, there's a really interesting moment that Telford Taylor describes when, uh, you know, Funk who had just said, you know, I was running the Rice Bank, I was involved in this and that and the other thing, and it was, you know, I didn't really, I wasn't involved in any of the sort of awful stuff. And then, in the middle of his testimony, documents were presented that showed that he had known that they were taking in all kinds of materials being sent from the concentration camps, and that he had known exactly where they came from and exactly under what circumstances they were taken. And Funk apparently just completely freaked on them. He was just like, oh my God, like suddenly realized that he was in a lot of trouble because he, you know, because uh, his defense, like I didn't know what was, you know, I was just a sort of cog in the machine was, was going down the drain. Um, and Fritzsche, Fritzsche really hadn't, you know, Fritzsche was just a sort of, propagandist. He, he was a kind of low-level guy who got swept up into things above his head. Hess, uh, Hess was really mentally ill uh, and he said that, Hess was an interesting case because he said as he was sort of being interrogated, I know I must have been involved in these things and if you say that I was, I believe you, but I just don't remember. And the psychiatrists who examined him said that they thought that that was probably true. Um, Hess was uh, incarcerated in Spandau prison uh, in the area of Berlin, uh, where he subsequently, much later, committed suicide in 1987. Uh, there were 12 death sentences. Bormann was sentenced to death in absentia. Uh, the sentence had already been carried out by the Red Army. Uh, Hans Frank, well justifiably sentenced to death since he had been involved in the clearing of all the Jews out of the general government of Poland, i.e. he had been involved in more than a million murders. Uh, uh, most of the high command, including, well, the two main guys, Jodl and Keitel, uh, were both sentenced to death for planning and undertaking the, the war in the East, which was illegal, and they also said uh, involved significant war crimes. And it basically, you know, let it be known that uh, the, under the guise of hunting partisans, that the, the, the Wehrmacht was, was to be, uh, was allowed to just shoot anybody that they wanted. And I mean, this is one of the sort of interesting things about this, that for a long time in Germany, there was a sort of idea, well, it was the SS that did all these killings. There was actually a book that was called The SS Alibi of a Nation. Um, and it wasn't until the 90s, there was a book that came out, and I cannot remember for life me the author, we have it here. Uh, but essentially the, the book sort of showed that um, the Wehrmacht had been extensively involved in partisan hunting. Partisan hunting is like sort of like code word for uh, shooting non-soldiers. Um, uh, and that and that the, like the, the, the Wehrmacht had been very much involved in the process too. So there was no, like the, there was a sort of commonly said thing, commonly sort of asserted premise, especially uh, among people on the right in Germany, like the honor of the, the Wehrmacht was intact, but, and it really wasn't. I mean, they had been involved in a lot of, in a lot of, uh, uh, in a lot of murders, not to put too fine a point on it. Yes. How did the two uh, naval? Uh, Dernitz was uh, sentenced to uh, ten years. I believe Raider was. I believe that that's what Raider was sentenced to. Let me just look. Oh, Raider got life. Um, but uh, both of them, if I'm not mistaken, hold on. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, they got long sentences, and, and but partly it was because they were involved in the plan. It was in, because of their role in the planning, not because of what went on so much at sea. Um, 
Okay, I'm doing all right. Seis uh, Ingvart. Uh, Seis Ingvart was apparently a, a pretty jovial guy for a guy who was on trial for his life. Uh, he was sort of constantly sort of telling Viennese jokes and. Um, but he had been the Gauleiter of Vienna and had sent a lot of people to their deaths in concentration camps. Uh, Kalten Brunner basically got what he had coming. Um, Kalten Brunner was described by Rebecca West as looking like an extremely brutal horse. Uh, he was just, Kalten Brunner really looks the part. I mean, it's too bad that you can't quite see. Where's Kalten Brunner? Right here. He has bad, like, scarring on his face, and he really just, you can imagine him, like, like calling out the firing squad. Um, the one thing that I think is a little weird, and, and, and pardon me if I say this, Streicher got sentenced to death. Streicher was a really awful human being. I mean, let us, let's, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to excuse him in any way. The, if you ever have the misfortune to read issues of Der Stürmer, it is one of the most vile things ever put on paper. Um, so, when I say that, if I say something that sounds like, I, you know, that he got maybe not exactly justice, it's not because I don't think he deserved to be punished. He was really a wretched human being and pretty stupid too. I mean, if you look, I have like the IQ scores of all of them, and, and he was, he was like routinely, he was widely recognized as the dumbest one. Um, but probably, I don't know that he should have been hanged. Now, having said that, so they, uh, the executions were carried out on the 16th of October uh, in the gymnasium at the Palace of Justice in Nuremberg. Uh, it was all done by hanging. They were brought in one by one. They used a short drop uh, so that in a couple of cases, uh, soldiers had to go into the compartment behind and pull on them until they died like it didn't break their necks. Um, some of them expressed uh, remorse. Uh, von Ribbentrop said, expressed remorse particularly. Streicher, his last, does anyone remember what his last words were? This is how I celebrate Purim, 1946. Uh, Purim is a Jewish holiday. Uh, didn't, didn't he also say one day the Bolsheviks are going to hang you? Yes, one day the Bolsheviks will catch you all. Um, so, well, it's not like a tragedy that he got hanged, I'm just saying. Um, after this, after the end of the IMT, Jackson stepped down. He had, he had wanted to go home for a long time. And Taylor, Taylor was promoted to Brigadier General in order to run this. Don't feel like you have to read all this. I'm going to tell you what it says. But, um, uh, Telford Taylor was promoted to Brigadier General because they wanted to have someone at, at, at general officer level to run the whole thing. They had a series of 12 more trials afterwards. People, I, I was sort of, you know, people, people center on the, the main one of the higher ups, but they then had a trial for the, uh, the, a, a number of the Nazi doctors who had been involved in the T4 program. The T4 program was this quote unquote euthanasia of, uh, of uh, mentally disabled people, mentally and physically disabled people. Uh, they trialed uh, the Luftwaffe general, Erwin Milch, Erwin Milch. Uh, they tried Nazi judges. Uh, they tried uh, Oswald Pohl separately uh, and uh, with 17 other SS officers. Pohl was a higher SS uh, officer and involved in the Einsatzgruppen. Uh, they tried Friedrich Flick, who was a, an industrialist. Uh, uh, they had a trial centering on the E.G. Farben industrial concern, E.G. Farben. Uh, so interestingly, so Auschwitz is a sort of interesting institution in the sense that it was a killing factory in the same way as uh, Majdanek or Sobibor or Treblinka or Belzec. Uh, but it was also an industry that had a gigantic uh, synthetic rubber plant at Auschwitz III that was run by E.G. Farben. Um, uh, trial for the shooting of hostages, trial for the higher SS officers for, uh, this is the RUSHA is the Office of Race and Resettlement. So these are the people involved in like um, 
racially cleansing areas of Russia so that they could resettle Germans there, ethnic Germans, so to speak. Uh, the Einsatzgruppen trial, where they tri tried the leaders of a lot of the, the, uh, the Einsatzgruppen, including Paul Blobel and uh, Ernst Sankuler and a bunch of people who really deserve to be executed. Um, Krupp, the, they had a trial uh, of Krupp. So what you'll notice with these, so in the Krupp trial, the Flick trial, the Farben trial, uh, people were uh, imprisoned and then stripped of their property. But there was an amnesty in 1951, and almost all of them got it all back. And a large proportion of the people who were doing time uh, were released either in 1951 at the amnesty they had then, or in 1956 and a subsequent amnesty. And in fact, 1956, they also passed a law saying that uh, if you had been a civil servant but had lost your civil servant pension because of having been involved with the Nazis, you got your pension back. Um, yeah. So uh, these was the, the Einsatzgruppen trial particularly resulted in a number of death sentences, uh, most of which were carried out. Um, but by the uh, turn of the decade, conditions had really changed in Germany. As early as 1943, the Allied governments had got it into their head, and by the Allies I mean us and the British, that the real problem was Russia, was the Soviets. And uh, it made Nazis look a little better. Who was more anti-communist, right, than a Nazi? Um, and as a matter of fact, those of you familiar with Operation Paperclip will know that the US government systematically grabbed up all the Nazi scientists that it could get, including uh, former SS major, Vera von Braun, uh, and another guy who, I, I, I can never remember his name when it comes to it, I need to write it down. There's a guy, he did, there's a building, he, he was the sort of father of, uh, of high altitude medical research, and there's a building named after him in Maryland somewhere, and he got his, he sort of cut his teeth doing experiments on people in uh, Dachau. Um, so uh, it became clear that West Germany particularly was gonna be our ally. So, so I was talking about this with somebody else recently. Stalin didn't want East Germany. When the East German state was founded, he was so annoyed at the East German communist leaders. He thought they were idiots. And, and the reason was, what he wanted was Germany unified and neutral because he was pretty convinced that the West would want to invade the Soviet Union pretty soon. They had been invaded, the Russia and then the Soviet Union had been invaded twice in the 20th century. He knew that the uh, United States, the British, the Western powers had a pretty negative attitude toward communism and toward the Soviet Union. So what he wanted to do was create a series of buffer states. This is really, you know, Stalin and his people didn't, you know, they thought that communism would eventually spread everywhere because it was the rational system. But they wanted it, what they wanted in East Germany, like the taking sort of power in East Germany was not so much about spreading communism because they thought that was going to happen anyway. What they wanted was a buffer so that they wouldn't get invaded immediately. And I'm not saying this to justify things that the Stalinists did in Eastern Europe because what they did was brutal and repugnant. But you have to understand what the reasons for it were. And so he was really annoyed because what then happened when, you know, like the Allies then got to form the other three parts of Germany into uh, the West German state, which was much bigger, and into which they poured large amounts of money through the Marshall Plan. I mean, East Germany was, a lot of it was deindustrialized because the Soviets came in there, the Red Army came in there and dismantled all the factories and took them back to Soviet Union. Um, but so as, as, as Adenauer's government sort of goes along in West Germany, we're sort of like getting, he did a very good job of cultivating us particularly. You know, he made it clear like, I want Western style democracy in Germany. And the, he and, and representatives of the churches, especially the Evangelical Lutheran Church, started undertaking uh, efforts to kind of get clemency for people who'd been sentenced to death. And I looked for it, but because I was in a hurry, couldn't find it. There's a really great book about this by a guy named Norbert Frey, um, which I can order for anyone 
who was interested, that there's plenty of copies in the system, not here, but around, um, in which the, 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 the head of the Evangelical Lutheran Church made this, wrote this letter, and I think it was to John McCloy, the head of the Allied military government, who said, you know, in the name of Christian charity, we think you should offer clemency to, the, I think the person under consideration at this point was Paul Blobel, who had been an Einsatz commando leader and was responsible for 20 or 30, 40,000 murders. And M McCloy, whoever it was, wrote this letter back, which he was like, well, look, you know, I'm as much for Christian charity as the next guy, but like this guy is a category one war criminal, so like we're, we're gonna execute him. Like there's no, like, now you might wanna sort of, I'd be open to hearing sort of suggestions about other people down the line, but this, you know, you can't, you're not gonna get anywhere by trying to get clemency of these people who murdered thousands and thousands of people. Now having said that, eventually a lot of these guys were amnestied. There's a fairly small number of people who ended up serving long prison terms. And part of the problem was that part of the sort of background of this was what was called denazification. So um, the, the allied military government came in and said there's sort of like five categories of people. Category five who are, who are unburdened, it lasted a uh, Category four, who were sort of fellow travelers, if you will. Uh, category three, uh, they got some restrictions, but no internment. Category two, who were activists, they could get jail. And then category one, who were the top level offenders. But even after, you know, after 1951, most of the people who'd been put in jail for this between 1951 and 1956 ended up getting out. Um, uh, so, what they were trying to do, what the Allied government was trying to do, governments were trying to do, what the occupation governments were trying to do, was kind of extirpate Nazism. And the, the IMT, the International Military Tribunal, was a key part of that, right? Because what they wanted to do was show Nazism was an illegal criminal enterprise. I mean, this was, this was the basis on which a lot of former members of the SS were prosecuted, not because they knew that not because it was, could be shown that they individually had done act X, Y, or Z, but because the whole SS was a criminal enterprise. Um, so this, I put this in because who doesn't love exploding swastikas? Um, <laughs> this, this is a, 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 a little bit of footage of them blowing the swastika off the, uh, the yeah, the Nuremberg, uh, the assembly ground at Nuremberg where they'd had the party rallies in the 1930s. Um, yeah, there's just something really beautiful about that. Um, but you'll notice, uh, so what you have here is the German eagle and it's had the swastika uh, knocked off it. I wish I could have, I was looking around, I still have, I used to live in Charlottenburg in the western part of Berlin and the Charlottenburg City Hall, this was the first time I noticed this, had an even more Nazi looking eagle above the door. I mean, it, it was the one with the sort of like, wings out to the side like the, like the Luftwaffe. And it had been clear, very clear that somebody had just chiseled off the, the like the, the talons were there, but they weren't holding anything. Um, but the point was trying to be made that they were trying to sort of extirpate Nazism out of German society. And they, uh, so you would have to fill out this questionnaire, the Fragebogen, uh, and then they would sort of investigate you to see what kind of person you had been. And you could get, this is a, what's called an Entlastungszeugnis, a clearance certificate, showing that uh, Paul Fischer uh, of uh, number two Graf Adolfstrasse in Wattenscheid uh, had been uh, investigated and had been found, had been cleared under the practices of, uh, under the provisions of the military government ordinance number 79, which is the denazification ordinance. Uh, and this was sometimes referred to as, so uh, there's, a, there's a very popular soap brand both in Germany and elsewhere, elsewhere called Persil. Uh, this was often referred to as a Persil shine, like a, a, a certificate of cleanliness. Um, this is, I wish you could see this better, but I'm just gonna explain what it is. This is a cartoon that appeared in a German newspaper in 1946. And what you see is, um, it says, uh, repentance of the sinner uh, was a cause of more joy than the, uh, than the, the ten uh, just men. This is a line from the Bible, of which you're all, I'm sure, aware. Um, 
So what we have is black sheep going in here, coming into the, what's, you, you kind of can't see, but it says entnazificator, the denazifier. They go down through this machine and they come down as little white sheep out here. Um, this is a pennant, it's got, you kind of can't see it, but it's got the symbol of Bavaria on it. Bavaria was the kind of homeland of the Nazis. And uh, there was a kind of jaundiced feeling about, the, uh, about denazification in West Germany. They really felt like it was very uneven. Now, th there's an interesting difference. In East Germany, so many of you will be familiar with uh, the diaries of Victor Klemperer. Victor Klemperer was a professor at the Technical University of, of Dresden. Uh, he was a Jew. His wife was quote unquote Aryan. Um, and uh, so he was not deported. If you, were married, if you were a Jewish person who was married to a non-Jew, they wouldn't, in Germany, outside of Germany it was different, but in Germany they wouldn't deport you. Now you had to live under very brutal conditions. They kept getting visited by a pair of SS men who they nicknamed Hitter and Spitter. Um, but uh, Klemperer kept a diary of the whole thing very famously, and it's really, if you're interested in what daily life was like in National Socialism, and it's also, I, I think Klemperer's diaries are just worth reading as a sort of statement of kind of human will to persist under, under horrific conditions. Um, anyway, so he went to the East. He was not a communist. He was a German nationalist. But he went to the East after the war, and the reason was this. The Germans came in, the Russians came into the Ger East, the, the educational institutions in the Eastern, in the Russian zone of control, and said, you're all fired. Uh, any of you who can prove that you were not Nazis can have a job and we'd love to have you. But if you can't, you're out. That's it. Uh, whereas uh, in the West, some people got, had problems. The philosopher Martin Heidegger, who had been, who had sort of trying to been kind of like fashioning himself as kind of intellectual leader, of, philosophical leader of German nation, of National Socialism in the mid-30s when he was the rector of the University of Freiburg, <laughs> had kind of fallen out with them, uh, he then lost his teaching credential. But a lot of people who had been associated with the Nazis didn't, or only lost it for a little while, and then got it again. Because once again, the, the Allies had decided that the real threat now was the Soviets, was, was Russian communism. Uh, and so they were willing to listen to someone come to them and say, look, you know, Hitler seemed like an okay guy at the beginning, right? And, and by the time I knew that he wasn't, I was, you know, it was too late. Um, <clears throat> or, you know, I just joined the party because, I, because if I didn't, I was going to get fired. And, and that, by the way, is not a totally ridiculous, you know, uh, explanation. I mean, one of our great mistakes, I, I try not to talk about modern politics, but I will say this, so I think it's fairly well established. One of our great mistakes in Iraq was firing all the Ba'ath Party people. Because to do anything in Iraq, you had to be a, a member of the Ba'ath Party. And there were a lot of people who were, a Ba'ath, were members of the Ba'ath Party because they wanted a job, not because they thought that Saddam was a great guy. So when you're sort of in the process of like uh, pulling apart a totalitarian system or an authoritarian system, uh, the, you know, there's some, I'm, I'm not saying this to defend people who are Nazis, I have absolutely no sympathy for them, but the fact of the matter is, in a, in a repressive system, not every member of the Communist Party in Soviet Union was like, hey, working class is great. I mean, a lot of them were members of the Communist Party because if you didn't want to be a ditch digger, you know, that was what you had to do. Um, but it also, you know, if you'd been on the wrong end of National Socialism, um, and all of a sudden you're walking down the street. Like one of the guys who had been the, the guy who ran the gas chambers in Treblinka, I think, was at some festival and he ran into one of the like 10 or 15 people who survived Treblinka. I mean like Treblinka, almost no one survived, but he ran into, and apparently the first thing he said to them was, how are you still alive? Um, but then this person turned, them, turned him into the police and he uh, ended up getting his just desserts. Um, but that happened to people, you know. You would run into these people who, during the war, you know, had, uh, I mean, this was what everyday life was like in National Socialism, too. Like, there was a lot of score settling, so, you know, your neighbor uh, annoyed you for years, so you, like, went to the local 
police and were like, yeah, I heard Fritz talking about Hitler being a jerk. You know, you could, there was a lot of that. This is, this is what happens in, in totalitarian systems. Uh, in December 1948, the UN passed the Genocide Convention. Uh, the term genocide was originated by a Lithuanian jurist named Raphael Lemkin, who had been working in the Allied military government. He wrote a book called Axis Rule in Occupied Europe in 1944, where he coined the term. The Genocide Convention is really interesting. I could give a whole lecture on that, which I won't do, but just to say. Article 2 of the Convention defines genocide as any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction, in whole or in part, imposing members intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. And I want you to think hard about some things that might fall under this. Now there's some problems here, like, say there's like five Native Americans in town and I shoot them, not to, not to justify this repulsive act, but just say like, if I did it because they're Native Americans, that's genocide, right? Because systematically, that's the in part part. If I just did it because they owed me money from a poker game, it's not. Um, so it gets hard also, you know, you have the case like in, uh, in uh, Cambodia. Cambodia is often referred to as a genocide. It's really politicide. Because the, the people who were doing the, the exterminating were the same racial, ethnical, uh, national group as the people who were the victims of the genocide. Um, so it's hard to, it's hard to, there's some sort of uh, problems of application. Um, the crimes punishable, genocide, conspiracy to commit genocide, direct public incitement to commit genocide, attempt to commit genocide, complicity. But so um, you'll notice, any of you who are sort of paying attention when the, when the Rwanda genocide was going on, nobody in the UN would use the word genocide. If you look in all the UN discussions, the word genocide is never, ever used. And here's the reason. Because... As soon as something gets labeled genocide, then people have to do something. And, I mean, who wants to send troops to the Rwanda? Like, where's the upside? You know, like building up treasures in heaven. Well, you know, I guarantee you, if you're the president and you're presented with the prospect of having to go to someone's family and say, gee, Mrs. So-and-so, I'm sorry your son had to die. Like, the reason is, like, to prevent one group of people who you don't care about from killing another group of people you don't care about. That's a hard sell, and it's not, I, I'm not saying this is a heartless thing, but it's, presidents think that way, right? You know, if you're going to go, if you're going to ask somebody in the U.S. Army to make the ultimate sacrifice, the last full measure of devotion, is, as, as Lincoln said, you need to come up with something you're going to tell that person's family to justify that sacrifice. I mean, we, I've, you know, blankly, we owe that to the, to the, to the, to the families. Um, so, the... The people in the UN absolutely didn't want to talk about that as genocide because if they had, then they would have been obliged to actually do something about it, which nobody, none of them wanted to do. There was just, once again, there's no upside. Um, I'll just finish up by saying uh, two things. One is this. Um, so after uh, the, the military tribunals, the national military, the, NERM, the subsequent tribunals, there were no more trials. And the whole thing, nobody wanted to talk about it um, throughout the 1950s. Um, there were a small number of people who really wanted to, who thought that some other things needed to be done. And one of them was this guy named Fritz Bauer, who was the Attorney General for the state of Hesse. He was the sort of, he started building up evidence against people because there, there had been a trial of Auschwitz people in Poland. Uh, in, in uh, 1946 that led to uh, lots of executions of people who deserved it. I think all but two of the people who were tried were, were then executed. Um, but uh, while he was preparing this, there was this interesting case, uh, the case of a fellow named Bogdan Staszynski, 
who was a KGB agent who perpetrated a number of murders in West Germany and was caught. And the, the, the German Supreme Court decided that he couldn't be held responsible because he had been ordered to do it by a government. So then Bauer and his people were like, well, this is great, right? We want to try these people who were like serious criminals. But we can only try, but because they were carrying out the orders of the government, we can only try them if we know for a fact that they actually did things, they themselves did things that were, uh, that were outside of the realm of those orders. Um, anyway, they, had, they, had, uh, they charged 22 men. 18 were convicted, one was acquitted, three were released for health reasons. Um, but the reason this is interesting is because it's, like, it, it shows you a kind of generational change that happened in Germany, right? Because the sort of kids who had been, say you were like six or seven in 1945, that means you're like 26 or, you know, 22, and you're starting to ask, hey, Grandpa, what did you do during the war? And the answers that they were getting, I mean, so this is a time that, that it's the kind of sort of nascent period of real student radicalism in Germany. And one of the reasons was this kind of consciousness that a lot of what had gone on during the Nazi period had been really swept under the rug. There had really been, there was a pretty quick pivot to, hey, we're all in this anti-communist struggle together. And, um, and once again, okay, so I don't want to come off and say that's like a completely ridiculous thing, right? Because, you know, the, uh, nobody in Western Europe, uh, no one wants to live under Stalinism who doesn't have to, okay? I think that's I think something we can all assent to as a principle. And, the, you know, nobody wanted the Red Army. So as a matter of fact, when, the, when, the, uh, when NATO was established, the, the British uh, representative, I think it was Jock Colville, said that the purpose of NATO was... Uh, to keep the Americans in, the Russians out, and the Germans down. Uh, and that's the, so there, was a real, there was a real consciousness that, that the Soviet Union was a, was a danger, and a danger on a kind of a worldwide scale. But so by the time 1963 rolls around, you've got a new generation coming uh, of age in Germany who've looked at, you know, they did a, they did a, they did a survey... 1956 uh, of the German Foreign Office, and it turned out, West German Foreign Office, and it turned out that a greater proportion of them had been card-carrying Nazis than in 1940. So, like, there were all these guys, so there was a big, there was a famous case where uh, uh, the uh, Adenauer accepted as a sort of legal official the guy who had written the uh, the sort of the, the commentaries on how to apply the Nuremberg laws. Um, so there was a feeling that kind of a lot of Nazism had been kind of swept under the rug. And the, the Auschwitz, the Frankfurt Auschwitz trial, was the kind of beginning, in a certain sense, of uh, an extensive discussion. Uh, one that I think was really help, helpful in Germany, because eventually, uh, now West Germany gave large amounts of money <coughs> excuse me, in terms of reparations to Israel, many of you will probably know, the East Germans gave zero. And the rationale that they gave for this was, well, why should we give money to a bunch of capitalists who happen to be Jews? Um, there's a really sort of nasty anti-Semitic undertone to that. But, but their, I, their premise was like, well, I mean, the East Germans were like, we were the victims too, right? We were, communists got victimized by the Nazis. And the, the, the there's a certain sense in which that's not wrong. The Nazis murdered lots and lots of communists. Um, but if you went to, there's a, there's a big, uh, there's a big uh, monument in the southern part of Berlin called the Treptower Park that has all these gigantic murals and statues that the Soviets built there. And you could be forgiven, after going through there, for not knowing that any Jews had been killed by the Nazis. I mean, it really like, their narrative was, you know, we were the anti-fascist fighters. So why is it that the Nuremberg trials are persistently important? Well, because they were a sort of first and very important step in establishing an idea of international law that allows for the hope, if not in fact the practice in every case, that people who perpetrate horrific acts will 
be brought to account. Uh, now, you know, certainly this has been imperfect. And I mean, I think if you look at the history of, for instance, the Serbian trials, which just, or the, the, the trials relating to the Balkan conflict, which just sort of wrapped up, uh, some people got their just desserts, others did not. Um, but it at least established the premise and some of the institutions that allow for uh, the bringing of uh, people who commit criminal acts to justice, people who commit, you know, large scale criminal acts. I mean, it's one thing, like, Jackson was very adamant, too, that, you know, I don't want the guys who were, like, just shooting one or two people, right? I want the people who were responsible for the mass murdering. And uh, so I guess in closing, I will just say um, we can, uh, if you look, if you ask, like, why is it that we study the Holocaust, right? Some people ask, some people say, well, um, it's to make sure that it never happens again. And if that's the case, well, we kind of failed, like, the, because it's happened, like, mass murder continues to go on periodically. But at least it sort of puts us in a position to try and understand these things. And maybe in the long and imperfect history of human development, we can take steps, not big steps, not final steps, but each generation taking another step to trying to ensure that uh, these kinds of things don't repeat themselves if we can possibly avoid it. Thank you. <laughs>